We're going to talk about bilinguals and in particular about this notion of language dominance. Bilinguals are very different from each other. On the one hand, we can give definitions that look at proficiency. How well does a bilingual speak their two languages? On the other hand, there are definitions that relate to daily use of languages. That's a very different matter. Then there is definitions that refer to thinking and feeling in languages. So really looking at psycholinguistic factors. And all these dimensions are part of being bilingual. Right? It's a very complex phenomenon. And one of the reasons why I'm interested in the topic of language dominance is that in the literature, researchers have looked at very different groups of bilinguals. They have studied sometimes beginner bilinguals, people who are learning foreign languages in a classroom setting, sometimes people who are using their languages on a daily basis. And the results from these studies are very difficult to compare. So what we need to do is get a better grip on the diversity of the bilinguals that there are in the world, because the contradictory results in the literature are often stunning and we don't know how to, how to go further with the literature if we don't get a better understanding of this diversity. So let's go and move on a little bit from here. Jean-François Grand, Jean, he's a French psycholinguist who lives in Neuchâtel and has written a lot of fantastic books about bilingualism, so I strongly recommend his works. Um, very accessible work he has written and also more complex stuff, but he has been saying now for more, almost 20 years, let's pay more attention to the different types of bilinguals that there are. What concepts do we use and how do we actually measure those concepts? And that can help us to avoid the, um, the conflicting results that there are in the literature. So my question about this is, to what extent language dominance can be an explanation because we don't know what it is, right? We first need to explore this construct before we can use it as an explanation. There is so many different ways that you could me measure uh, language dominance. So we can look at it in three different ways. We can look at it from a social linguistic perspective, and then we can say it's the dominance of language in society. Right? In the northern part of Belgium, for example, Flemish is spoken most frequently, it's the dominant language there. And in Wallonia, it's the other way around, it's French. Right? So the most people in that part of Belgium will speak French. And in Brussels, as you probably know, it's bilingual, but French clearly is the dominant language in that more people speak it. So that's looking at it at the level of society. But what we are looking at today is actually looking at bilingualism in the individual. How does an individual cope with having more than langu languages, more than one language on a daily basis? And there is a third way that we can look at it, I'm not doing that, but that's, that's a very interesting avenue of research, is to look at hemispheric dominance for languages. To what extent are the left and the right hemisphere involved uh, when we process languages? And that's a lot of, of research going on at the moment. And we don't know how these different levels of different perspectives on language dominance relate to each other. So today we'll be looking at this bit, right? The psycholinguistic aspects of language dominance. So this is a very famous definition ex explaining all the different components of language dominance given by Liz Lanza from Oslo. Language dominance is essentially a psycholinguistic phenomenon closely intermeshed with sociolinguistic parameters, right? So she basically says, uh, don't look at, at language dominance simply as something inside a person's head because you're not going to be able to understand the phenomenon. You need to take the social context into account. Let's not try and do as if this is something that's just an isolated phenomenon in a person's head. Uh, there was a very interesting article by Gigi Luck and Ellen Bialystok in 2013, and they say uh, that there are actually two key dimensions behind the bilingual experience. And they've also been mentioned by yourself today. It's bilingual usage on a daily basis and language proficiency. They came to this conclusion on the basis of an, a detailed analysis of questionnaires of bilinguals. To, at the same time, they took, these bilinguals took a lot of different tests and they did a factor analysis and they found that the different tests that they took and the questionnaires really showed there are two basic dimensions behind the bilingual experience. And these are 
bilingual usage and they are language proficiency. So what we, what we um, need to do when we look at bilingual dominance is to actually look at these two dimensions. Um, and that reflects really nicely what Fishman, Cooper and Ma already said in 1968. And it's a lovely definition of what actually these terms mean. Very simple definitions, language proficiency, what a person can do, right? Whereas language use is what a person typically does, right? So I can understand very complex uh, syntactic structures in, in, in English, but I do not necessarily use them all the time, right? And if I use certain constructions, certain words very frequently, then I'm more familiar with them. I'm going to be faster in processing them. I'm going to be quicker in a language uh, lexical decision task or in, in processing tasks that involve syntax. Um, but it, in any case, these two dimensions is what we need to look at. That's, there's a lot of evidence that these two are the key ones that we need to look at. Maybe it's not enough, but these are the basic ones that need to be included in the definition. And quite, uh, therefore, I quite like this definition given by Xin Wang in 2013. And she says, language dominance is a global measure of relative frequency of use and proficiency in each language. And the word relative here means that you compare proficiency in the two languages and you compare frequency of use in the two languages. And if you include both of these, you're going to get a grip on uh, language dominance. And she actually says in that article, I very much recommend it, that actually language use is more important and more revealing than measures of language proficiency in explaining the phenomena that she was interested in and that was um, semantic priming task. We don't need to go into that in any detail, but she is actually advocating to look in more detail at the frequency of use. And she says, and I agree with that, is that we have looked too often at proficiency. It's all the time about what we can do, but maybe we should be looking more at what people do on a daily basis, how frequently they use languages. But maybe we don't have the tools at the moment to really look into that in much detail. What we do when we measure language dominance is to often define it in relation to proficiency or language competence. That's the most common definition of it. So you look at proficiency, say vocabulary or syntax in one language, and you look at the same thing in the other language, and you compare the proficiency in each language. So that's what it means to look at relative proficiency. And how does that work in detail? You can relate that to a very famous model of language ability that was developed by Bachmann and Palmer from 1996 onwards. And they have a new book in 2010 where this is developed in further detail. So their overarching construct is language ability. And under there you have language knowledge and strategic competence. The strategic competence refers to your ability to convince Right? You, are, you need to convince somebody of a particular argument, and how do you go about that? Um, organizational knowledge and pragmatic knowledge is under language uh, knowledge, and organizational knowledge that means grammatical and textual knowledge, and pragmatic knowledge is social linguistic competence and functional competence. And if we look at um, language proficiency, grammatical knowledge and vocabulary there, we need to realize that we're just looking at one tiny little box of what it all involves to use language, right? And maybe it, I don't say that it's wrong to look at that, but I just need to, we need to realize that there is a lot more, right? And if we want to look at language dominance, I always ask myself, why are we only looking at this little box, right? How can we operationalize balance? That is then the question that we need to ask. Now here we go, and we get a lot of different measures that people have used to measure language dominance. And we're not going to go through all of this, I just want to show you that people have operationalized, have tried to make it measurable in so many different ways, right? Grammaticality judgment. Give people a sentence and say, is this grammatical your language or not? Reading speed. Give people a text and ask them to read as quickly as possible. Right? That taps into fluency. Ability to translate, um, accent ratings. So you, you speak and you ask people to rate their accent on a 10-point scale, etc., etc. 
So you see the diversity again of the measures, and you could imagine that whatever measure you pick, you're going to get a particular result, but it doesn't necessarily mean that if you do a different measure, you're going to find that the person is dominant in that language, also on that particular measure. So what we need to um, realize, first of all, that language dominance is task specific. Right? We pick a measure, possibly because we happen to be interested in that. I have this bias that I'm interested in vocabulary. So I'm going to pick that as a measure, but I need to be aware of the fact that if I took a phonological measure, I might get something really different. And the dominance measures sometimes do not even correlate. And that's really, really scary in a way, right? It shows us that this competence is so diverse that we can be strong in one area of the language, but not in another area of the language, right? It also means that this notion of overall language dominance becomes more and more problematic. I, was, I believed strongly that there was such a thing as overall dominance, right? Because if you ask a bilingual, which one is your stronger language? They often can give you an answer, right? They can say, yes, uh, my Italian is stronger or whatever. But the problem is that you don't know what they mean, right? What aspect of the language do they mean? They might be more aware of the vocabulary. They might be more aware of their pronunciation. But maybe their syntax, they just don't know. They don't have this insight into how good they are at processing syntactic structures. So they don't think about that might be very weak in that, but they feel that they have a lot of words. So if they say, my English is dominant, they might be referring to their vocabulary, but you don't know. Right? So you get the idea that there is such a thing as overall language dominance, but if you start digging into it more deeply, you probably find that that dominance is not an all or nothing concept. It's, it's just distributed over different parts. So you can be more or less balanced with respect to a specific criterion. Okay, so suppose you have a vocabulary test for both languages and you compare the results and you can say, okay, stronger in Italian than in German. Right? That's possible. But it doesn't mean that you are overall stronger. It is too strong a claim. We can't probably say that. A static or dynamic, uh, clearly, as we've seen in the clip already, it's, it's dynamic. It can change over time, it can change slowly, it can change more quickly. There's a very famous study by Barik, 1995, uh, studying bilinguals uh, that emigrated to the United States, uh, several hundred people, and some immigrated fairly recently, some immigrated more than 50 years ago. And he looked at a category fluency. And he says that after 12 years in a country, you actually become dominant in a language categorization task in the second language. It takes about 12 years. And for many other tasks, so letter fluency task, where you, where you ask people to give you lots of words beginning with an F, right, one minute, give me words beginning with an F, you don't switch dominance. You stay dominant in your first language. Right, then how do we compute uh, language dominance? Uh, you can either say I'm subtracting scores of one language from another, or you can say I am dividing uh, scores. So if you are subtracting, then your scores, if your maximum is 100 on each, on each test, then your scores can vary from minus 100 to plus 100. If you have full scores on one test and zero on another test, then you have a plus 100 or a minus 100. So it's very important if ever we use language dominance indices that we try to use them in such a way that they actually perform a meaningful uh, task, right? And that's a point made by Flege in 2002. You want to be able to predict performance on the basis of your language dominance index. Otherwise, what, what's the point of doing this? Right? It needs to explain something. That's what we were talking about earlier. To what extent can language dominance explain anything? Right? All this complexity of doing these indices, what's the point unless you can say, really, it explains variance, it explains behavior on another variable? So where do we go from here? We're going to look at the impact of different domains on language use. 
language dominance. We're going to look at the complementarity index that Grosjean has, has developed to measure actually how we use languages across different domains. And we need more tests of dominance based on vocabulary required for different domains. So here we are. Thank you very much. Vielen Dank.